In a minute, Christian and Professor Kim Sondo, you are online on Facebook page of the conference. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. We are online. Okay, the world is watching us. Yes, please take the charge, Christian. Oh, okay. Hello, everybody. Shall we wait a few more minutes? We have so much time for the planner, for the keynote, for the plenaries, for this lecture so let's just Hello, everyone. gather more people now if you allow me christian uh, just a few seconds in this moment uh, our conference is online on the facebook page of the conference semiosis in communication thank okay. you so we need to wait a few minutes more You mean it's open to the public? <laughs> now it's open to them, so we can start now, don't we? Maybe we will have some guests, uh, I mean uh, students from our faculty, from uh, their faculty, and uh, we are waiting. Okay. I suggest to wait uh, a few, one or two minutes more. Okay. Excellent. Just to get a ring. Excellent. Is live on Facebook. And uh, most of them uh, will be on Facebook for sure. Oh, sorry. Do we need to go uh, on Facebook we... too? No, no. You you stay here. <laughs> you okay. don't need to go to right. Facebook. I mean, for, okay. students. for students, we have a live link on Facebook. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Christian. Now uh, I think is the moment to begin, Christian. Begin. Okay. Good morning everybody welcome before the official welcome part um, i'm very happy to take part in this uh, event my name is christian bankov and i have the honor to present you professor kim sung do from uh, seoul university um, professor kim sung do is a of popular culture of um, smart cities of uh, art and uh, a lot of subjects. He published many books and many articles. He was in his European tour one year ago when the pandemic uh, closed the world. So he was about to visit also the Balkans and we will do this uh, sooner or later. So now um, I will leave the floor to Professor Kim sung who, by the way, is also in the Bureau of the World uh, International uh, Association for Semiotic Studies. He is responsible for Asia and Oceania, except China. So the topic of uh, Professor Kim sung lecture is Semiotics of the Anthropocene, Agentivity, Narrativity, and Temporality. Uh, Professor Kim sung the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, very much for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction. So I should share No. Yes, we see it now. No, it's not another. Sorry. I should change. Oh, sorry about that. I copied you. Sorry. Sorry about that. Right. Take your time. We have 
55 minutes more to go. Okay. So I have uh, uh, one hour or how Okay, many? one hour, one, one hour. hour. All right. no okay. <clears throat> so you see the slide and my, uh, can you hear me? We hear you, but we don't see your uh, PowerPoint. Not yet? Not yet. Not yet? You have to use the share button. There is a green button. Yes. Yes. Share screen. In the bottom of the screen. And just put the PowerPoint, but you have first to open the PowerPoint presentation. Right. Ah, okay. Okay. Yes, now, now it's working. Go. All right, that's great. Okay, so the title is uh, 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 Paul Leverman at uh, Anthropocene uh, Semiotics. So I'd like to treat uh, three dimension uh, narrativity, uh, temporality, and agency. That's a big project, it's a big, uh, big subject. Uh, sorry, Professor, you, you can put on the full screen uh, your slide. Just yes. uh, go down and you have the uh, micro icon where you yeah. can uh, put on the uh, slideshow, full slideshow. There, no, no, on the on the left a little. There, yes, yeah. right, 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 a little right. One, one yes, more. Now right. it's okay. Ah, yeah, okay, great. Okay. Yes, thank you. That's okay? Yes, now it's perfect. Okay, so. Uh, in this communication, I uh, attempt to reflect a uh, conceptual framework uh, for a research program uh, to construct a semiotics of Anthropocene, all of which has not been uh, explored in depth so far. Indeed, uh, the Anthropocene uh, pose crucial challenges for semiotics today, which must be uh, renovated to adapt to the challenge posed by this new geological epoch, although uh, it is still controversial. The semiotics of Anthropocene must go beyond all the limits uh, imposed by semiotics and contemporary human and social sciences to grasp the nature uh, of the unprecedented change, not only in the history of the earth, but especially in that of human knowledge of nature or need. Of course, interaction between humanity and nature must be reviewed. The first task of this new semantic program is to capture oh. the narrative characteristics that manifest themselves in the discursiveness of different accounts from Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is a great story whose narrativity is a semantic object for excellence. The second task of this new episteme is to semiotically redefine the anthropos, which is now both the most important main factor of change in the world and the main agent in the production and the distribution of all the nitrogen cycle. And in the disappearance of nitrogen, how to conceptualize this ambivalent actant, which cannot be grasped with the conventional categories of agency. In this regard, semiotics must construct a new vision to go beyond anthropocentrism as well as all the forms of naturalism by totally rethinking the power and the impulsions of the human agent and the striking 
agents of the world, Earth. The third challenge that the Anthropocene poses to semiticians can be characterized by the situation of confronting totally heterogeneous temporalities on very different scales, namely uh, contrast and um, interweaving between the slow pace of geological time and the rapid pace of history. Moreover, as the French philosopher Bruno Latour has pointed out, now it is as if the distinction between human history and the natural history or geohistory has suddenly disappeared. I will focus on the semiotic implications of this new temporality. My ambition is limited to providing a summary uh, description of these new potential areas of collaboration between historians and semiticians. In short, researchers around the uh, nation but galloping interest in scholarship on the Anthropocene by pointing to a resurgence in interest deep time and the long duration or long durée. In particular, I would like to highlight the potential for the development of long-term narratives at this time of questioning the agents and effects of geological change. Continuing from these first issues, a first more difficult and radical epistemological and methodological task would consist of re-examining and redistributing the established domains of the natural, the social, or the symbolic. Insofar as neither nature nor society remains intact in the Anthropocene, it is hardly justifiable to maintain the division between the cultural sciences and those of nature. The fifth task is to introduce a new scale of space, namely Gaia. It behoves semiticians to understand the meaning of the collective imaginary and the epistemological and semiotic signification or significance of the introduction of a figure that is not religious, but ecological. In this context, we would propose a neologism of geosemiotics inspired by the discipline of geoethics. Uh, you know, the subtitle of this uh, book, uh, discourse in place proposed a geosemiotic space is totally another history. Yeah? The sixth task is worth mentioning. It is a question of deepening the problematics of sensitivity, which applies to all the actants involved in the Anthropocene, from Gaia to the Anthropos. This aspect can be studied in the semiotic apparatus of the uh, semiotics of uh, sensible or semiotics of passion. Among these six components, I would like to uh, deal with the first three. Now, let me uh, provide some elements about the, uh, the concept of the uh, Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is first and foremost a geological concept that designates an irreversible ecological event that suggests the destruction of the world. 
or more precisely, the sixth extension of life on Earth. Its existence as a new epoch in post Holocene planetary history, in which human beings are seen as part of a quaternary era, is emerging as a hot topic in the academia, indeed. The Anthropocene is emerging as one of the hottest issues in the 21st century environmental discourses and in the scientific community beyond earth sciences sector. Today, most geologists uh, officially recognize its strategic uh, graphic reality and they formalize it as an epoch rather than error period of age. The modern use of the term Anthropocene began in 2000 with Cruzen and a thermal paper in the Global Change Newsletter, simply entitled The Anthropocene. This was uh, followed in 2002 by Cruzen's high profile piece in Nature, Geology of Mankind, which he gained much wider circulation and attention. This short perspective made a case of case for the Anthropocene in terms of magnitude of human impacts on the Earth's system, in particular climate change, but also ranging through deforestation, energy use and air pollution, harvesting of fisheries and climate change. And it concluded by arguing that there may be a need to employ large scale geoengineering to optimize climate. Hence, the core of this initial proportion came from the relatively new discipline of Earth system, which examines the Earth as an integrated system in incorporating its physical, biological, chemical, and human social dimensions and employs the microscopic tools of in situ and the satellite based monitoring programs and the computational model of the Earth system. Following the cruise and peace in Asia, there was initially a slow but gradual increase in use of the term scientific literature, in particular in the environmental and Earth system sciences, where it became an eye catcher but ill defined term for human dominated modernity. Crucian partner with the climate scientist Will Steven and environmental historian John Magnell to present a more detailed and analytic case for the Anthropocene in 2007. A pivotal event in terms of gaining wide scientific acceptance and adoption was the publication of a thematic issue of a philosophical transaction of the Royal Society in 2000. 11. This issue covered a range of perspectives, including conceptual and historical antecedents, biosphere transformation, sediment uh, flux, etc. And Anthropocene now truly adopted in wide environmental scientific discourse by an urge in the numbers of scientific papers the topic Anthropocene and three new scientific journals emerged dedicated to this concept, Anthropocene. As you see, is a galloping interest in the concept of Anthropocene. That move this move uh, forward uh, toward a formal definition. So part of the schematic nature of the term Anthropocene within the natural sciences comes from the, its intent and origins, as it is a concept driving from the earth systems and environmental sciences, but it adopts the nomenclature convention of geology. Spread as a cultural zeitgeist beyond the various scientific uh, usages, whether formal or informal, the Anthropocene has spilled out of its earth system sciences origins 
and has been adopted as a contemporary environmental and cultural icon. The key event in this cultural mainstreaming uh, was the front page of the economic, Economist in 2011, which he declared welcome to the Anthropocene. It is employed for several purposes, but at its broadest contemporary use, it encompasses a notion that the relationship of humanity with the natural world has changed. Although when exacted in the past, this change may have happened is a subject of intense debate. Therefore, all of nature is touched by the hand of humanity. And the realization of the implications of this change requires a new worldview. The phrase in the Anthropocene in a title can entail a variety of meanings, ranging from in a, in a world that has been pushed away from Holocene stable state, state through in our modern human dominate times. Of course, of many of these meanings have drifted some way from the original intent of signaling human domination uh, of the Earth system. In all these various firms, the Anthropocene has become a device for re-examining and discussing the role of humanity in the natural world on time scales from deep past to the far future and on scale from the intimately reflective and personal to the planetary and the geological. So as you understand, the one of key uh, problematics uh, to the modern uh, con uh, contemporary uh, uh, semiotics, I think is question of scale. The Earth system, uh, science perspective and uh, uh, papers, Cruz and Stromer, originally based their argument for the interpersonal from the perspective of the Earth system science. The core argument here is that cumulative sum of the human activity is disrupting many aspects of planetary functions and moving them outside the modest range of variability that has defined the Holocene and in different warming direction that is or soon will be outside of the range of the Pleistocene glacial interglacial cycle. So there are many perspectives from the biosphere perspective, geological, historical perspective, and the cultural and the philosophical, political, etc. So where is the place for this semiotics in this debate of Anthropocene? It is argued that the uh, Anthropocene worldview can further encourage uh, human domination of the natural world, one which views nature increasingly as an object of management and gardening rather than a focus of reverence and spirituality and the last pack. So by this notion, so this advantage in geology uh, and earth system uh, science indicate that we have entered the new geological epoch of Anthropocene by the work of Jalcevius. By this notion, researchers and the increasingly sophisticated public refer to the well-established fact that human action and its physical manifestations have become a geological force shaping the future evolution of the biosphere and earth system. Greedy humans have endangered Gaia in the earth system with their lives and humanities and semiotics are now urgently called open to raise fundamental questions and solutions for the human survival. When did the Anthropocene begin? begin? Scientists differ on its origin. The most likely hypothesis that 
it would have started at the start of the Industrial Revolution at the end of the 18th century. Another hypothesis is that the first nuclear test carried out in the Manhattan Project by the United States on July 16th, 1945 in uh, Lamongo uh, uh, in New Mexico. Market is start. They agreed to fix the date on this genesis around 19. Of fifties, uh, as is known, the central idea of this term, which uh, has, was proposed by Paul Krusen, a chemist, and Eugene Sormor, as you I said, a biologist, to denote the interval inter interval of present time in which important geological conditions and processes are profoundly altered by human activities. So it is useful to distinguish between three points along a spectrum of the degree of human influence of the environment, which underline different ways of using the concept of Anthropocene. At one extreme, the Anthropocene is defined to have started when there is any discernible human influence so from even from the Homo erectus on the local environment through modification of local ecosystems and the shifts in local biodiversity. One consequence the, of adopting the early Anthropocene viewpoint is the recognition of the long history and the prehistory of substantial human alteration of the environment. For example, the likely major human role in the extension of most of the planet's large land mammals that accompanied human expansion out of Africa and the uh, ensuing alteration of many ecosystems through tropic cascades uh, and not always recognized. So it's quite controversial. Yeah, the Anthropocene is also a political and a semantic event. Thus, as the French anthropologist Philip Descola correctly uh, pointed out the origin of Anthropocene does not concern all mankind, but it is due to certain classes, certain systems, certain way of life, certain ideologies. It is therefore urgent to grasp with a critical eye the semiotic specialities of the lifestyle of modern civilization that we have taken for granted in order to disconnect ourselves from this lifestyle and these values. The invention of a new way of life in which humans reconcile with the earth and live in the solidarity with one another is the most important task of humanity. In the Anthropocene era, the vocation of a structural semiotics or, or even contemporary semiotics is to participate in this common task by building an adaptable program of environmental semiotics. Just a quick question. What's the relationship between the Anthropocene and the COVID-19? Well, it's a bit, uh, difficult question, but I think it's a common uh, factor uh, uh, we can find in tipping points. One could read quite a few articles dealing with the relationship between the coronavirus and the current ecological crisis, which we have come to level Anthropocene. A shrinking wildlife, habitats, species migration, and a dangerous close human animal contact directly or indirectly responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic? Or does the corona crisis rather present a temporary break in the otherwise relatively increase of greenhouse gases, a breath here for else pollution, hot spots, a chance for an ecologically sound reconstruction following the economic collapse due to the reduced traffic and halted industry, blue skies, 
have suddenly returned to many cities for the first time in decades. Is it a dress rehearsal for the great climate collapse as Latour said last year? Or looked at from a different perspective? Does it offer a bite by force of circumstances, an experimental space in which to test out how things might be done differently? Proof that it is possible after all to limit travel and the transportation to reorganize work and communication and to reduce the consumption of fossil fuels. Could it even present an opportunity to reinvent international cooperation in the face of global threat? These questions can hardly be answered at present. What I propose to consider here, uh, epistemic and the semiotic links between the ecological crisis of Anthropocene and the corona crisis. These are to be found is, I'll argue, lasting causal or metonym, metonymic relationships. The Anthropocene as a cause of COVID-19 or the pandemic as a symptom of the Anthropocene, then in temporal structures and event forms. What kind of a are we witnessing? What do the two crises, ecological, Meta crisis of the Anthropocene and the global pandemic have in common. And Dimitri, viruses and climate change are very different insofar as the viruses may be seen as having agents of their own as actant in terms of uh, grammar and symmetries. While climate change is a multi-causal event or process attributable to humans. Nonetheless, the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change are, are can be seen to share a pattern that may be characteristic of the Anthropocene. We can conclude that while the pandemic in itself is engendering significant transformations of our societies, there are very good reasons to address those challenges together. If we will build, we hope to build a reliable Anthropocene or anthropocentric uh, uh, Anthropocene semiotics. Professor Kim Sung Do, just yes. a small remark. Uh, we are about half of the time, and I see that you have many more slides. So please yes. keep in mind. Okay. Anyway, uh, I can finish all the slides <laughs> so, <laughs> because I rearranged. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I have a so uh, half hour. Yes. In the last sense, I, a, I a bit less to have few yeah, questions. I can. Uh, I can. Yeah, skip. In other words, the COVID nineteen pandemic was local, natural origin, but becomes anthropogenetically mediated and amplified as transmitted across great distance, thereby becoming a globalized when acting vulnerable populations, etc. So our purpose is that it would not a perfect fit, the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate change present relatively similar patterns in causal factors. So what's the role of the immunities and anthropocene error? I will want to uh, understand the whole notion is more a matter of hard natural sciences than of our soft human and the social sciences. However, one may wonder whether the human sciences are legitimate to intervene in the topical, topical debate insofar as they deal with the human action. The global crisis is forcing us to reconsider our relationship to the great history of Anthropocene. A new sense of the scale and impact of human activities must convince semioticians that it is time to engage with the Anthropocene. The following offers an attempt to sketch some of the narrative ramifications of this engagement 
and our growing symmetric literary historical interest in this new age in which humans have become a geophysical force on global scale. So the question arises, what could the humanities and the symmetries in particular do in this field of theory of a practice of the Anthropocene? There are at least four dimensions to consider. As concerning the actant responsible for the Anthropocene, there points to the way of life of modern civilization as a code, stressing that a small part of humanity has meanwhile appropriately aided Earth and devastated to ensure what she defined as her well-being. In this regard, environmental ethics strives to rethink the foundations of different moral rules that organize the relationships between human and non-human beings. Three ethical suggestions can be distinguished. First, as a human central ethic, it is about the sustainable management of the earth for the human beings. Second, it is a life central ethic that respects the right inherent in the existence of all beings on earth. Third, the ecocentric ethic refers to Gaia thinking which sees the earth as living beings, as inspired by you know, Leopold or Calliot, American uh, uh, scholars. From an, an epistemological uh, uh, perspective, the human sciences and the semiotics must prepare a new transdisciplinary paradigm, the environmental humanities and the environmental semiotics. The Anthropocene is an event and a turning point in the history of Earth and of life of the humanity. The Anthropocene will totally change our representation of the world. On the ontological level, it is necessary to ask a fundamental question concerning the fundamental distinction of the modern Western world, such as a normal humanism, the ontological rupture between human subject and the object of nature. With the arrival of Anthropocene, humanity faces complex limitations with many creatures other than humans. Modern thought, such as Bacon and Descartes, who viewed freedom as the uh, detachment of human beings from nature, not only in effectable in the Anthropocene era, but also represents a dangerous pride. Firstly, on the political level, the Anthropocene also questions the definition of freedom, the cornerstone of the modern civilization. The concept of modern freedom has long been conceived in opposition to nature. John Stuart Mill likened the individual freedom and autonomy to their success in the struggle in nature. Therefore, in the age of human-made ecological damage, it is necessary to invent the concept of freedom and the idea of liberation, which is different from the idea of modern man. In this context, the most important task of the environmental humanity is to connect humanity with the other beings on earth and explore sometimes richer and more liberal freedom can only be conceived within the framework of social passions and institutional arrangements. As the historian Chakrabarti observed, these institutional arrangements constitute a system which must be re entirely revised by the fluctuations triggered by the Anthropocene. So what is symmetry modeling for the Anthropocene? The nature of the relationship between symmetry and the Anthropocene must be twofold. First, symmetry is a transdisciplinary methodology appears effective in problematizing and then solving the complex problem that is Anthropocene. Symmetry theories, concepts, and tools can contribute to this problem denization by presenting the salient symmetry features of the unprecedented event in the three dimensions, methodological, epistemological, ontological. In return, symmetry can draw inspiration from the Anthropocene to renew the epistemological foundations 
and open up new horizons by going beyond the limits of framework established in the totality of uh, its, uh, its, uh, its theoretical apparatus. Before focusing on three major problems caused by Anthropocene, narrativity, temporality, agency, which are uh, intimately linked, I'd like to evoke just six thematic characteristics of Anthropocene, complexity, transit disparity, globality, ecology, and evolution. The object of Sicilian inspired structural semantics, that, that of primate semantics, must encompass the, the six dimensions in order to understand and explain the Anthropocene from a semantic point of view. At the same time, to renovate and ex expand the semantic vision. In sum, in the Anthropocene era, uh, the sign and the meaning and the communication that constitute the object of contemporary semantics observed to be reshaped by including these six dimensions. For example, uh, the, uh, the exemplary of the tense this point of semantics has been recognized by the application of grammar semantics in the model of network act theory uh, by Latour and his teams. In semantics, the issue of anthropocene is not fully addressed. A French scholar, Buddy uh, Ambel, study constitutes an exception in 2017 by identifying the semantic issues of the new concept within the framework of Landowski's social semantics, which inspired by inspired by focusing on the ecology of meaning rather than the economic meaning. That represents a vision of existence reduced to the economic management of values and the significant because with an intention to dominate and operate the world. On the subject of narrativity or narrative uh, priority, we must uh, also mention the, uh, the diversity uh, of the uh, genre according to the disciplines that will uh, uh, this unprecedented uh, phenomena from the natural sciences to the human and the social sciences. Narrative semiotics must uh, welcome this priority of narrative as its new object to explore its power of knowledge and its practice to clarify its narrative structure. The triple dimension of structural semiotics, which are uh, action, cognition, passion, can be applied perfectly to the narrativity of the Anthropocene. The narrative representation of the Anthropocene. All, uh, as will be seen later, uh, the Anthropocene has become the subject of various geohistories, to use the term coined by Latour. The science of the Anthropocene is much more than just stories, but they are stories anyway. Paul Cridgen's very first Anthropocene article, 2000, 2002, also set, set, contained a clearly narrative statement. The Anthropocene thus emerges as a new grand narrative as postmodernists claim its end. In this regard, we first note a proliferation of accounts who, that bring out almost as many versions uh, uh, as they are, ways of approaching the world, capital scene, and uh, uh, and the machinal scene, climate scene, industrial scene, et cetera, et cetera. More than 150 different names claim evidence not so easy to establish, even in terms of uh, global warming. It should be noted that each of these terms leads to a narrative reflecting on relevant fact or facet of our present Anthropocene. So the narrative dimension is thus conformed in this diversity of the stories. Telling the, uh, so, uh, so I, I try to, uh, uh, establish a, a small typology of three types of postures that diversity uh, in the characteristic uh, region or uh, of anthropocene narrative, deconstructive, 
convergent and relational. Uh, Boniface uh, and uh, or Francis approach the Anthropocene by trying to play the role of a storyteller. First, they want to deconstruct what they consider to be the great geocratic narrative of the Anthropocene told by the natural sciences. They suggest instead of such a monolithic narrative that making sense of what happened to us means produce multiple debatable and polemical narratives rather than a supposed hegemonic narrative, a political. Why the assertion that there's one unique and hegemonic scientific Anthropocene narrative I intend to reiterate here their narrative approach. They offer no less than seven imaginary title alternative narratives, such as the Calamocene or Patocene. Uh, I mean, the uh, history of the increasing commodification, uh, et cetera. The convergent postures manifest itself in Radur. The felt needed to write Anthropocene narratives, however, is not limited to the historical studies. He crosses all possible disciplinary boundaries, and according to Bruno Latour, there are good reasons to, for that. With Earth becoming a full-fledged actor, he doesn't think we need more than one story. Instead, Latour argues for the need for a convergence of possible stories, bringing together human and non-human actors in what he calls our common uh, geo history. The third posture that I would call relational and independent, interdependent, can be found in the work of uh, uh, Chaco Barati, who presented the most elaborate narrative model of the Anthropocene. Indeed, how do we tell such a story? Returning to historical studies, he attempts to answer the question in the most thought-provoking and thought-provoking way, a pioneer in theme of what the Anthropocene demands of historical thought in the famous article, The Climate of History, 2009. So the stories matter to us. Indeed, the stories that the elite of industrial modernity have told themselves of nature as exterior and aimless of the world as a resource of progress and freedom as an escape from the determinations and the limits of nature about technology as a cause autonomous primacy served as a cultural origin and the conditions of the Anthropocene. With the uh, Kronos foundational reflections on the history of the environment as a storytelling can provide information for a narrative study of Anthropocene discourses. His famous article, A Place for Histories, Nature, History, and Narrative, compared the ways in which several historians have uh, recounted the transformation of the great uh, plains from the mid 9th century to the uh, 20th century, including the dramatic event Dust Bowl. We have uh, 10 more minutes, Professor Kim Sung, though, and then the system okay. will uh, close uh, automatically. They told me. All right, that. 10 minutes, all right. 10 minutes, I can, oh, yeah, I can present the synthesis. So there's a naturalist narrative, currently the mainstream, and a story from nature, and the story the echo catastrophe narrative, and the firstly echo Marxist narrative, etc. So, for example, story two announced the Anthropocene as the end of nature, its most ardent defenders promise a world without nature in a good Anthropocene. So let me uh, just uh, pass quick. This some uh, a kind of uh, uh, isotopic uh, features of the Anthropocene discourses. First, uh, 
a kind of alarmism and globality and irreversibility and handling and catastrophism and unpredictability. Uh, also, I uh, could find a, an important uh, isotopy, uh, monumentality. Now, temporality. What does what follows about uh, also be on the new attention of literary and historical scholars to the regress of uh, an art school, historical school, which has developed the most enduring theoretical reflection on historical continuity and long lasting change. In the last manifest of history, Armitage and Goldie, credit Ben Brodel, second generation reader of Echo de Zanal, with one of the most sustainable reflections in the long run. However, despite a major contribution Brodel and his colleagues in this field during the 1950s and 60s, Armitage and Goldie argued that thinking over long time scales is slowly faded from historical science in 1917, 2000. Bordel tried to uh, provide a more rigorous basis for the long term instead of focusing on an idealistic, quasi Hegelian ideal of civilizational progress as a key concept animating human long life. Bordel attempted to root the longer time scale in a conception of the relation between history and uh, human geography. His ambition, as he put it, was to explore the imperceptible relationship between man and the environment, a story in which all change is slow, a story of a constant repetition. So the historians and literary writers including focus on the long term, especially in the category of deep time, how could this new concern be different from the developed by in the civil agent stories of Toyin B, et cetera, and a school? The answer I'd like to argue lies in examining temporal imperatives brought about by storytelling in the Anthropocene. The attempt to expand the temporal scale is also part of a process responding to political change. The slow but steady collapse of the nation as a paradigm in literary and historical studies and an attempt to find a new territorial case. So now it's the geological time. So uh, of course, this is another uh, uh, story. In other words, the uh, let me escape the uh, just so the part of the uh, agencies uh, because the semantic regime of temporality you can find the uh, something is substantial because the time is just is missing link in the contemporary semiotics, especially in terms of uh, uh, long duration. Uh, that's why I would like to focus on this necessity to review the concept of time in the uh, in the Anthropocene and the COVID, because I just published a small article about the narrativity of COVID-19. I found that there are some very important inter interesting uh, 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 findings, because COVID for me is a, is a totally non-linear, non non-linear, unpredictable narrative. So how to handle this kind of uh, narrative? Nonlinear and great acceleration, etc., unpredictability. So I have three minutes in the agency is a very crucial question. Just uh, I'd like to evoke this uh, problematics. So the advent of Anthropocene with this uh, rapid procession of uh, fortress and sometimes irreversible catastrophe make carefree humans suddenly and abruptly realize that they are living in a totally different environment than they had imagined and believed for centuries. Leaving them helpless. So uh, under this new climate regime, as Lato put it, the environment is no longer passively inert, but now has a fairly powerful agency. But Gaia is also a metaphor. He borrowed from James Lovelock, a British scholar who presented 
as high process as early as the 1970s. So in terms of CMAT models of agency, we would refer to the constitutional model of grammars by asking the main question, who is the sender of the Anthropocene, Earth, nature, or Gaia? But Latour's use of the metaphor Gaia does not simply connotate the planet Earth's living superorganism. On the one hand, he used it as a shorthand for the multiplicity of and proliferation of various human entities and non-human operating and whose combined actions has an unpredictable impact on Earth. As Descola has shown so well, what makes it even stranger is that this animism, which he calls he called naturalism, the most anthropocentric of all the mode of relationship invented through the world to deal with the associations between human and non-humans. So the proliferation of agent is precisely what introduced no difference between humans and non-humans, the result of this over complex Rationalization is quite simple, a controversial fracture between a subject, the earthbound, and anti-subject, the human, in competition for an object of value, that means the survival of humanity, which incidentally remains largely anthropocentric. So there is a, yes, so, yes. So secondly, another, uh, Another okay, very few minutes. One minute. One minute, like. Okay, one minute. One, so, two minutes. yeah. Uh, so there are different kinds of uh, uh, actor, uh, terrors, and uh, Leviathan, etc. Neither Gaia and the nature can assume this actential role within the frame of modern science, even in the semiotics. The previous three determined norms cause the laws of nature established by the natural sciences in accordance with the modern understanding. On the one hand, humans as a dominant category seems to understand a complex mix of all manner of uh, competing interests while having in common steadfast adherence of the famous progress motor plus ultra environments, geo engineers, capitalists, et cetera, et cetera. In much simpler terms, Philip Descola calls these unstable collectives ecosystems or systems of interaction between human and non-humans that would be entitled to rise. So this kind of uh, uh, Actant model was proposed by the Fuki Enver. I could not repeat. So, my conclusion so, what is the uh, uh, author, uh, what is the castle of author agency? In, and also, in terms of agency, uh, the relationship between ethic and agency, because uh, uh, we have the motivation to act right now. So, finally, this question of the anthropos. In fact, it's a question of responsibility. So the ethic dimension should be underlined. Thank you for your understanding and for your listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kim sung Do. Thank you very much. I guess the organizers will distribute the presentations. So those who are curious to read it more closely, especially the last slide, they will have the chance. Now, I'm afraid that we have to close the lecture because a new session will start. I received this information from the coordinators. And okay, if there are some fast questions, but. Yes, I'm thank afraid. you, Christian. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Kim Sundo, for your interesting presentation. Yes, your presentation is open for all lecture after this on a Facebook page of conference and also for a YouTube channel of the conference is available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.